All right. Hi again, everyone. It's great to have you with us. It is about a minute after the top of the hour, and we'll go ahead and get going. Again, welcome to the February installment of our Early Efforts webinar series from the Hunt Institute. My name is Dan Worry. I'm the director of Early Learning, and we've got a great panel together today. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, who is president and CEO of the Hunt Institute, for a few opening remarks. Javed? Thanks, Dan, and thanks everybody for making time to be with us today. Uh, for the benefit of anybody who is new to our programming, the Institute was named after a four-term North Carolina Governor Jim Hunt. We uh, serve as a education and policy support to governors, state lawmakers, and, and other elected leaders across the country. We run the full continuum from prenatal to post-secondary uh, to include the workforce. And today's webinar will allow us to explore the serious widespread consequences of the pandemic, uh, that is, you know, the, the impact the pandemic has had on children specifically and families across the country. This pandemic has highlighted the fragility and importance of the early childhood education and care system in this country. As states began to shut down childcare uh, and education programs uh, closed, unemployment rates uh, saw a rise. A large number of early educators and caregivers themselves faced unemployment. Throughout this year, the early learning study at Harvard has traced the experiences of Massachusetts early childhood educators and caregivers, children and families, uh, drawing conclusions about the impacts uh, of the pandemic. Uh, so I wanna thank our special guests for representing uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, the Massachusetts Department of Early Education and Care, uh, Educare Springfield and the Bainham Found Family Foundation for making time to be with us today. Uh, our Director of Early Childhood uh, Education, Dan Worry, is going to lead our conversation. So, Dan, I'm going to kick it back to you to get things started. Great. Thank you, Javade. And again, today's panel will uh, focus on the impact of COVID-19 on early care and education through the lens of the early learning study at Harvard University. Uh, we recognize, by the way, uh, the study focuses primarily on Massachusetts and its response uh, to, the, to the pandemic. So this is one state, but a state that is representative of uh, really the early learning system across the, the nation. Diverse uh, program uh, stakeholders and the public and the private sector dealing with the, with the pandemic. So, um, you know, uh, like, like many states, uh, Massachusetts actually ordered earlier education and care providers to close uh, for a time back in the spring, is back to uh, reopening and uh, looking forward to hearing about the findings of the study. We are joined today by Dr. Noni Lasso, who is the co-director of the Zantz Early Education Initiative at the Harvard Graduate School of Education uh, and one of the principal uh, researchers involved in the, in the early learning study. Also by Commissioner Samantha eigner Twardy, who is Massachusetts uh, Department of Early Education and Care Commissioner, uh, and Nikki Burnett, who is the director of Educare Springfield. But uh, we are uh, even luckier uh, to be joined by our moderator today, Dr. Shana Cook, uh, who is the Senior Manager of Early Learning Systems at the Bainham Family Foundation in Washington, DC. So glad to have all of you with us today. And at this point, Dr. Cook, I will turn things over to you to begin our, our panel discussion. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, one quick clarification. I am in a doctoral program and I have not yet become a doctor, but um, hopefully we'll be well on my way. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Um, we are here to discuss the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the early care and education system and on the lives of families and young children, uh, particularly in Massachusetts. The early learning study provides insights on pandemic related concerns, disruptions and, and adjustments, including program operations, use of public supports, remote engagement, personal well-being family needs, and children's lives at home. Uh, I thought we'd start uh, today's discussion um, thinking about the big picture, and I'd like to let each of you weigh in uh, with some of your initial insights on the findings. And let's start uh, today with you, Noni. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had serious widespread consequences for providers, children, and families. To understand these impacts in Massachusetts, Focus surveys were launched with samples of parents and guardians of young children, early care and education providers, and early elementary teachers across the state. To begin our conversation, will you provide us with a high-level overview of the key findings? Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's a really great and important conversation. Um, just to 
just to back up a tiny bit, the early learning study at Harvard launched in 2017 and happened to be running as a longitudinal study representative at the level of settings and children and families, um, borrowing actually from public health methods. We launched this survey, this study by uh, a census-like approach where we knocked on 95,000 doors to, to get to neighborhood representation setting level across the mixed delivery from parent only and unlicensed through to formal and then representative at the level of three and four year olds. We've since been following them. Then the pandemic hit. And um, well, it's just devastating and horrific for children and families and providers, um, the study did give us a, an opportunity to look actually at the effects of the pandemic because we had years of data leading up to it on children's development. So I just wanna set that context. During the pandemic, we had um, the opportunity to continue to survey uh, parents, excuse me, and caregivers, as well as providers. And I'll just give you a few highlights to your question. The pandemic is in the end, right? The canary in the coal mine that it, it, has, it has only served to bring to the surface the fragility of the system, the decisions we have and haven't made about the public good and whether we're funding uh, in stable and, uh, and really strong and robust ways. Um, and it also uh, in many ways brought to light just how difficult um, life can be for families in low income circumstances and for their providers. So I give that context as well, which is to say I could go through a litany of findings none of which are particularly pandemic specific. In other words, the pandemic is a major stressor that gets launched into a system that is already stressed in many ways, right? So I just wanna give that context as well. So with that, let me say a few specific things. First, the family childcare was by far the hardest hit. That will not be news to the commissioner nor to our colleague in Springfield, but these are providers who literally lost their income overnight, right? So that's, you know, I think as we continue to think as a society about our childcare system, and by the way, the study had for two years told us that family-based childcare is a strong preference among large groups of families particularly as it relates to their child's age, which is to say, I might choose family childcare for my three-year-old, but not once that child turns four. So then I think when I put the commissioner's hat on, I think about the way our states are still gonna always want, though we've been tipping the scale towards policy making and evaluation that sits at a very formal level, Family childcare is very desirable for many, and it's also what's feasible in a lot of neighborhoods. It's also, also often what's culturally responsive and sustaining. They were the hardest hit by far. The second finding I would say that's worthy of uh, these opening remarks is um, I don't need to tell you all that it's a very resilient and dedicated workforce. At the same time, a lot of these providers suggested, and then I scrambled. I did a lot of remote work, even without a paycheck. I was checking in on families. I was trying to find them food cards while I was actually looking for secondary employment to keep things going. That's a little, that's tough to listen to and hear and think about in the way that we want to own and support the space and the workforce. It was just so, both so inspiring and challenging to hear in the sense of those circumstances and just tremendous dedication in the face of a lot of struggle. Um, the third thing I will say is uh, many did, and this is uh, certainly kudos to Massachusetts, and I don't know how specific this finding is to Massachusetts, but many at the same time reported a lot of access to health and safety resources, that Massachusetts is a state that pivoted very quickly, that stood up an emergency, uh, system that brought a lot of the really critical public health practices and resources to the providers. Um, 
You know, I think on the family side, it's not surprising. The stress went way up. It was disproportionately stressful for low income uh, households. The screen time went up. It's hard to calibrate how much, screen, how good and what quality, but lots of minutes and lots of concerns about from parents about um, screen time. So I'll, st I'll stop there. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Commissioner, from a state perspective, what are some of uh, your initial insights into these findings? Absolutely, and thank you uh, um, for me as well to be here and have an opportunity to highlight all of uh, not only what came out of this study, but the implications both from a macro and a very individualized level of in Massachusetts. And um, I will say that just building on what Dan started with and, and Noni highlighted is that while this is a Massachusetts specific perspective, um, I speak with a lot of my colleagues uh, every single week and there are certainly trends here that, uh, that, that transcend any specific specific state and point to some of the bigger issues that Noni was pointing out. Um, I will start not because I uh, will um I'd like to highlight that I still am only a year and a half in, but um, I uh, I grew up in Massachusetts and I have been in Chicago the last couple of decades and I came back to this role uh, to take this role in August 2019 and I just like to highlight that to uh, have everyone understand how little I know about the landscape here prior to COVID, um, that how much of my tenure really has been driven um, by uh, the urgent need in the field to address some long standing issues that we um, discovered nuances to in Massachusetts during a strategic planning process uh, for the six months prior to COVID, um, but really recognize that, and as, as uh, Noni had pointed out, recognize the um, the, that this highlighted the vulnerabilities of the field and what I would say in my, my career in early childhood and some of the most, the most impactful investments that we can make um, in society, in early childhood, in our youngest children, the families and professionals that support them. Uh, that there are a lot of cracks in the system that this really pointed out. So uh, Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts, just to give you a little bit of context, uh, has, um, as Dan pointed out, we did close childcare. We have a significant footprint in family childcare. So some of those findings that Noni had pointed out around family childcare, I think are particularly significant in, in Massachusetts and, um, and are like most of the country where we had been losing family childcare from the system prior uh, to COVID. So we had lost around, I think, 20, my numbers are all messed up now that we've been, uh, uh, everything shifted. Um, but, uh, you know, we had lost about 20% in the five years prior to COVID. Um, and so for a system that is um, a full employment economy prior to COVID in Massachusetts, some of the most expensive care in the country, um, and some of the most limited access, that that family child care filled in a tremendous gap for working families. Um, that, as Noni said, when we went into to closing recognize that their income was shut off overnight um, and that they were operating with no savings, no credit, and as independent contractors or sole proprietors. And so it was a real um, vulnerable part of our mixed delivery system that was essential as we look towards not only um, how we sustain families, but how we move towards recovery. So um, just so giving that context, uh, certainly our center-based providers, I certainly don't want to, to discount them, but we, uh, we do have such a large footprint in both that it makes a very unique system to try to figure out what strategies would actually head us uh, to overcoming some of these barriers as we look forward. Um, and recognizing that family childcare um, needs a different kind of system than the one we have really built towards group and school age or what we call group and school age in Massachusetts, but center-based, um, that you have a, a, a built-in community in a center-based program that can support each other, that can help fill in the gaps, that can be knowledge sharing, um, and that in family child care, not only as we went into the pandemic, was it economically isolating, but also very socially isolating, having not, ha um, not have not had those resources um, and really trying to maintain that, that dynamic with families. So I just want to point out a couple of things around what this, uh, this study, I think, demonstrated about our system, but also just to highlight some of the potential we might talk about a little bit deeper as the webinar goes on. Um, I have said it, it really pointed out the vulnerab vulnerabilities in the system across, I think, three key areas. One is um, around our financing structures. We are, a, we are funded much like you would think about funding yoga, uh, where a family pays for the service. We 
we subsidize about 20% of our system with tuition subsidies. Um, but in, a, in a, a, a sector that serves quarter million children a day, 20% is not going to sustain uh, the revenue stream for the other 80%. Um, so all the efforts we could make in our in our system during recovery really wasn't going to compensate for, as Noni said, the, the real vulnerability facing the workforce right now um, from the financing system. That if we believe this is public infrastructure, we weren't funding funding it as such, and it was forcing us to really think differently about how we sustain a field um, that may have fluctuations in demand for the next few years as parents are really grappling with their own challenges. Um, the second thing is the workforce. This is a human service, and so it is reliant on the humans who serve. Um, and having, being relying, again, on some of the most impactful investments we can make are rely in young children are reliant on the adults around them who help foster that really solid, emotionally responsive, developmentally appropriate uh, engagement with them. Um, and when you take a very vulnerable workforce that was already stretched to meet a really critical need um, and, and expose the vulnerability, I think what we've seen is, as the study points out, um, a lot of challenges in the workforce that's making it hard for them to show up every day and be who we need them as a society to be to young children. Um, and third, I will say the other thing that it really highlighted was um, that parents' needs are changing rapidly and we don't have a system that can um, pivot quickly enough to help meet them uh, without just overtaxing already overstressed individuals, right? So parents needed this connection. They need help with their children. They need Needed, um, the, and, and their lives are changing rapidly too. And our system wasn't necessarily um, set up at a state level to meet that rapid demand. And we were um, particularly reliant on the individuals in the field to try to tell us what families were needing in a really rapid way. So that will highlight the potential I'll end this, the, the, this response on, um, is that I think we have, what I have seen in all of my work in early childhood, I have known the power of our workforce. I've been in the classroom. I've been a coach. I mean, I know that people are committed, but I have seen a dedication to work together differently. Um, and you see this in the study as well of just trying to serve differently and innovate and think quickly. And I think that actually the recognition that we are a critical infrastructure with the tremendous vulnerabilities that need to be addressed if we're going to recover, along with the potential of this field to have rallied and pivoted and done what they need to do shows us that as we think about the strategies we need to recover, we can um, really help overcome the challenges we would end with. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Nikki, Educare is the nation's most effective early childhood network of schools uh, with an approach that extends beyond the classroom. Um, and your place, um, Educare, is placed in Western Massachusetts. And so you have a unique perspective on the needs of uh, families and children and their voices um, in the Massachusetts community. What are some considerations from this study that need to be elevated from your on the ground perspective? Sure. Thank you. And thank you so very much for the invitation to be here with you today. As I was listening to Noni and Commissioner, I was like, you know what, it's so great to be in a space where we all are really thinking about the same things, but have a little uh, different nuance to put um, on it, just based on our lens and our experience. And so, you know, at Educare, as you said, we are um, part of the Educare Learning Network. We are the 24th Educare in the country and the only one in the state of Massachusetts. And so we do, we are in a very unique space, but in a very powerful space that we're able to bring our teachings out and as well as really have certain stages to advocate for the workforce, for the, the parents and for the children. And so, you know, a lot of my sentiments echo um, what's already been said. And, you know, just thinking about the workforce of early education and family child care, they are considered essential but they are the most vulnerable. Um, as it was already said, a lot of times the pay and benefits for that workforce are not comparable, comparable to actually survival. So many of our workforce in early education, they are also eligible for certain state benefits. And so we have a workforce that are working eight to 10 hours a day and are always on. And they have the very, very important task of teaching children 
but they are compensated as well. And so, you know, with COVID-19, with the closures, you know, a lot, of, a lot of them, it really, really put the squeeze on them. And not only just the pay and benefits, you know, they also have families that they're as just as worried about COVID as the rest of us are. Um, I call them our heroes. We have a very small workforce that are going into the building every day and they're doing this every day. And the stress and the trauma that they are undergoing, I can't even begin to imagine because I'm working from home. And so this population, this workforce that are so fragile in not only finance, but also in exposure, we're expecting them to be the saviors of our economy. And so when we're putting that kind, as a society, putting that kind of pressure on them, that also adds to it. Uh, also, you know, I, I would, I really appreciate the study and I appreciate it as a longitudinal study and I pray that it continues to be because going forward, our workforce and the way that we have to function is gonna change very, very much. Um, corporations are understanding that hours can be different and work modes can be different. Therefore, there's gonna be a lot of different requirements and needs of the workforce and as well as parents that are sending their children. Um, and then it also really, as you were talking about a lot about family childcare, it made me think about, there is still a, a very much a disconnection between family child care and center-based. Um, you know, so many times it, it's, it kind of feels like there's this competition um, where, as we know, all of the slots for early education in the state are not even filled. So there shouldn't be a spirit of competition. So what can we do to get the children into these spaces for early learning and so that the parents have the appropriate choices and, you know, as Commissioner said, some want to have um, in-home childcare, which is great. And that could be because of transportation or, or work hours or whatever. How do we fill all these available spaces appropriately so that the families are supported, the children are getting the best and safest education possible, and that the workforce is also supported? So those are, I mean, I, I always have questions, so I'm I'm sorry, I answer questions with questions, but that is my thinking. How do we continue to move this needle along and understand this needle is gonna look real different going forward because you know this is COVID-19 has really highlighted that. Guess what? You're gonna have to do different. And positively it's highlighted that we can do different and that we should also continue to do so. Building off what all of you have said, um, you know, all of you mentioned in your responses, uh, family child care, and the fact that there's a delicate balance in a mixed delivery system with centers, homes, and school-based settings. Um, but uh, I think Dr. Lasso noted that family child care providers, you know, have a unique strength um, in the system, and they're irreplaceable, and they are uh, Massachusetts alone, the study found uh, that 87% of family child care providers reported uh, that their income was affected during the pandemic. Um, and one in three providers uh, expressed uncertainty about the viability of their business. And I'll direct this uh, question at the commissioner first. How can we use the findings in this report to help in building the early uh, care and education system back? and build it back better. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think there's a few ways. And I think that uh, that for family childcare, one thing that I think to keep in mind, uh, let me start by, I think the few ways have to focus on the parts of the sector to Nikki's point, we need a variety of, of um, different types of programs to meet the variety of different uh, parents' needs. And one of the biggest challenges that we have in making sure parents can access childcare is getting the appropriate kind of services to meet their very specific needs. And from the state policy perspective, if we look ahead and thinking about, the, about um, building back, the hard part is, is that families' needs are changing so quickly um, and not always in their control, right? Both in, in employment 
employment questions in schools and what schools are doing for their older kids and who's available to watch their children and all of the, the compounding factors that they are um, they're grappling with in the landscape. Um, and so as we try to build back, getting some prediction and some estimates that allow families the type of choice that choices that they will need to consistently have options um, and respond to their own reality <laughs> um, in ways that that don't jeopardize the future of their children, their own economic stability, all of those those areas. And so when we think about this, I think that there we need to come up with unique strategies for the different parts of our sector and to think about um, uh, to think about th those strategies as building um, equity in the workforce. I mean, we in in Massachusetts uh, have in there are three education agencies, uh, early education and care, elementary and secondary ed and higher education. We have uh, the most diverse workforce and the lowest paid workforce. Um, and so when you look across those 42% of our workforce in Massachusetts is primarily women of color. Um, and so, uh, and you think about when we're talking about building back that workforce, when we're talking about needing a variety of different roles and, and services and supports for that workforce to be able to show up every day, we have to think about designing those specific to the sectors. Um, Family child care can't step away for an hour during lunch. Center base may be able to. And center base, they may have their own kids at home in the evening and can't step away in the evening. So we need to think about those variety of strategies that help meet the workforce where they are. Um, and really think about investing in those humans specific to where they are and where they're working if we're going to build back a system that can provide more equity across our workforce. But the second thing I will say is that we also really need to think about the equity for families. And when we have a per child model that subsidizes tuition for some very specific eligible families, um, to Nikki's point, it creates a lot of eligibility barriers that have left Massachusetts with a lot of gaps in access. But more than that, it really does, if, if we want to think about um, equity in our programming, we have to start thinking about how we have equity and access that everyone can access what they need and provide the and, and in an affordable way. That means thinking beyond subsidies. It means thinking beyond, um, it, it thinks uh, beyond families being on their own to identify and access and afford. It means thinking about it as critical infrastructure and shifting our financing structures that can build a critical infrastructure with an eye to equitable access as opposed to reliant on families to um, to drive the market. Yeah, Noni, it looks like you want to jump in there. You well, I was just going to say, that. I mean, certainly this fits, you know, two, two things to in, sort of amplify there. And we've written about this in the briefs. But first, like, systems building can't be at the level of the individual. Like, it just the individual is in the system that has an infrastructure, right? So what the commissioner is pointing to that we certainly picked up on in the study, and again, the study just sort of like highlighting the fragilities that were there prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, if you fund at a grain size that is above the individual, that is units potentially at a program level, at a neighborhood level. You can think of lots of ways to create a funding model that is more robust and that doesn't cost much more. But in terms of its implementation, it creates much more stability in the system. Um, we wrote about that in part because, you know, the providers who experienced um, very, very much, uh, not nearly the levels of stress it, the providers in the system who experienced not nearly the levels of stress, say, as the family child care, were those in Head Start programs and in four-year-old pre-K classrooms in school districts, right? Why? Because they're, they are within a system that has been funded that does not depend on whether a child walks through the door or not. So I just want to underscore that, that we, you know, this grain size issue kind of funding at a unit level transcending this notion of attendance and enrollment and instead sort of a mad, taking a more demographic approach to childcare is one thing. And, and the two are related, which is that if we're going to meet families' needs in the reopening years to come, um, 
And, and 45% of children are in informal settings in Massachusetts. And it looks like on the early side of the data that families are choosing more informal arrangements post pandemic for all kinds of obvious reasons of health and safety, but also access. And we're gonna drive up learning and development then, then we have to reduce stress necessarily on the workforce. Like there's a vicious cycle that is about to ensue here, which is that the most affected children and families are going to take up the services of the providers who were themselves most affected at, if we think about it that way. And in the, in the overall uh, model of support and, you know, for learning and development, whether it's at the child level or the adult level, we just, we can't continue this way. If the financial stressors are as they are, we're never gonna get to the quality of the interactions that are actually gonna drive up the commissioner's system overall, right? That we've gotta free up folks psychologically to do the work of the healing, the, the, the trauma, the trauma informed practice. There's a lot of workforce development to do that was there before the pandemic that's only cr more crucial now. But if we don't have a system that is, that is, that is operating in more robust ways, we're, we're gonna be in a vicious cycle for, for a little while. And I think the CARES Act money gave us a window, and the commissioner could talk about this, into how we might start funding in more robust and flexible ways so that we're not so tied down bureaucratically at the level of administering funds, at the levels of individuals and providers wrapped up in all kinds of um, showing uh, who was there, who wasn't there, charging the state at the level of the individual. Thank you for that. Um, switching gears a bit, um, Nikki, I know you had mentioned that you need to, and the commissioner mentioned this as well, we need to adapt to the needs of families and we may have to change our models and our models may need to be uh, more flexible uh, going forward. And that might be part of what the building back better system looks like. Um, in the survey, um, it showed that a lot of um, Massachusetts uh, children and families had to engage remotely. Um, and we know that even in the best circumstances, engaging young children remotely can present a lot of challenges. Um, and as the findings show, educators and caregivers have developed partnerships with families and engaging stra strategies with children to navigate these challenges um, and really have been able to be innovative um, in that uh, distance learning, family engagement, remotely um, space. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are the challenges that you continue to face with remote engagement and remote learning? And how might we use the findings to support educators, children, and families going forward? So um, like many, uh, one of the very first and most glaring issues that we had was just that digital, what everyone talked about, the digital divide. Um, you know, when we quickly had to um, pivot to online, we found, number one, so many of our families didn't have the basic learning materials at home to even engage in learning and enrichment. And so understanding that, yes, okay, we're all going to go virtual, but everyone that was not at the, at the same starting line. And so to have to say we're offering it, but not truly offering what's needed to participate, that's where there was, we saw that, that was a huge lack. And when it came to digital, we found that there were, there was a lack of people having devices. We had some parents that were trying to do online enrichment and learning with the, the children on the telephone, on their phones. That's not optimal. Then we also found that so many parents didn't have the, the basic knowledge and know-how of getting on to an online portal um, as opposed to maybe doing something on your phone or getting on an app or a website. We found that their, their literacy of the digital was very limited just to what they needed. It wasn't that they it was wrong. It was just they didn't need to. They didn't need a class dojo before that. They didn't need Google Classroom before. So they, did, they didn't need it. And then we also found, um, which is a broader um, conversation about co connectivity. 
you know, so, okay, we're going to give you a, a, a laptop. We're going to teach you how to use it. But are you in a place that doesn't have Wi-Fi? Again, offering remote learning without offering them the knowledge and the materials and the connectivity to actually do it. You know, we had to we had to scramble. Um, and then also, you know, when it comes to to workforce, I often think about how our workforce are also consumers of the services that we're giving to our parents and our families. Um, you know, I, that's just something I really grapple with. I really, really do grapple with that. I think that, you know, when we build back better, I think that we should focus on in overall, this is, this is what is, this is where we want to be and focus overall on where we want everyone to be and bringing everybody there together, understanding that some people don't start at the same level. So the, the effort or the support that you and strategies that you put forth for this um, person on this lane may not be the same. Um, you know, I really love what Noni said that we need to have a demographics and needs-based approach. I cannot, I cannot stress how important that is. Within Educare, we have some families that, you know, they're on it and they're doing it because they have different strategies and supports and resources at home. And then we have other families that, you know, we have to do a little bit more handholding and that's okay. And that's all okay. You know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm just very mindful of building up people. And as, and so if I can just switch, sorry, to family childcare, um, when the commissioner was talking about building the workforce, um, part of one of the tenets of educare is professional development. We have embedded professional development where our teachers are getting that all day, every day on the ground. And the commissioner spoke about family service, uh, family child care providers, they may not be able to step away to do professional development or afford it. So how do we wrap them in, embrace them with our professional development, which when we're back up to full operation, we'll be able to do. So I, I just, um, you know, with, with building back in our continued challenges that we have to continue to wrap people in to where we are and just understanding that everyone's not starting off from the same starting line. So we cannot just, you know, throw a blanket solution and think that it's going to solve for everyone. Absolutely. I can, can I, you want to yeah, can I just add on to that? I think that that's exactly, um, I think all of what Nikki said is correct. And I think that um, I, I, I hate to be uh, always the optimist and that we can build that better, but um, I think that is actually the opportunity we have in front of us right now. Uh, Massachusetts, like states across the country, to Nikki's point, are seeing reductions in our enrollment, in our subsidized enrollment, and in um, and in you know paid parent uh, tuition based enrollment. Families are choosing and opting out of group care settings for very legitimate health reasons. And it will fluctuate for the next year at a minimum as community rates change, as vaccination rates change, as, um, as uh, communities who maybe were hesitant to a vaccination do or don't get one. I mean, there's there are so many factors as people go back to work, as the economy starts back up, as we have different elements. Um, and I think that's the opportunity we have in front of us. We will not see a fluid, steep incline in enrollment to be able to just head back to where we were. And we are going to have to look at how we take into account who and how need services and think about building and sustaining the capacity we have in a way that will help us make sure that when families do need services, they are available to them at affordable, accessible places and rates and all of that. Um, and I think that this is forcing us to think differently in a way that can only help us be better later on um, because we can't go back to the system we'd have in the last 12 months. And in a state like Massachusetts that has seen 82% of our providers come back to operations, but on razor thin margins and on the brink of closing down, we want to sustain 82% of our capacity coming back to operations so that when we have 100% of families back, we have something to build from. Um, and that's going to take us right now, right here, thinking differently and, and employing new strategies. 
Thanks. Two of the briefs discuss well-being, um, educator well-being, as well as family well-being. Um, and I'd like to pose this question to all of you um, from the researcher perspective, state leader perspective, and program administration um, perspective. What do we need to do to ensure that we're factoring in family well-being and educa educator well-being as we think, as we look forward, you know, right now in the present during this pandemic, and then looking forward beyond beyond um, the current state. I'm happy to start. Um, I certainly addressed, I think, a lot of the systems um, interventions. I think we need uh, immediately to really address, as as the report and as you know, my colleagues here have have highlighted that um, to address some of the real vulnerabilities in the system. That the workforce is able to be responsive. That we're able to do what we know works with young children to be able to drive outcomes and to be able to build family well-being. So I will focus on something very specific here. Um, we need to build better feedback loops and we need to listen. I think we pit to Nikki's point, we have pitted sectors of our um, uh, of our um, the system against each other. I mean, even when we think about um, subsidies, right, when we pit families needing to be able to access the care they need with providers who need that subsidy to just pay their workforce, um, we build these in ingrained tensions. We have to be able to listen. We have to be able to understand the root causes of these challenges and start to offer new, new ways and I think in Massachusetts, one of the things that has been a remarkable benefit of COVID is, um, and I think, you know, I certainly knew about the early learning study prior to coming to this role, and I think that there's so much we'll continue to learn. Um, and it is one of many lenses that we are bringing together through advocates, through providers, through family child care outreach, through, um, through uh, we obviously get a much deeper, richer parent perspective in something as robust as this survey, I mean, as this uh, process, um, but trying to bring all of those together so we don't have to pick sides, that we are trying to solve the problem in a way that invests at, uh, uh, because we know it takes all of those stakeholders to have a successful society. And so really trying to think about that in for that infrastructure building back with that perspective. Let me, let me build from there just for a second um, and say two other things. Um, one related, one kind of another, another way to think about this and throw something else in the mix. One is um, when we talk about well-being, you know, um, I think this is. I just want to try something out with all of you. I think one thing about the sector that, in my view, has needed a push and a change for a long time and is in part the genesis of the Xanth Early Education Initiative at Harvard is actually we need a much, much greater lens on the adults. And when we talk about quality improvement, let's not always put it in terms of the children, because, you know, in some ways, this skipping over the adults has been a big piece of how we've gotten to where we are, which is that all of a sudden we're trying to expose the workforce as actually the critical infrastructure. And we've be instead been talking about access and slots and amounts per child. And, in, I don't know of any other sort of human practice sector that has been so hyper-focused on the client or the outcome rather than the inputs and the human capital. And so I want to also just put in the mix, while we're talking about well-being, that is entirely confounded with quality outcomes. There is no skipping over the adults in all of this. And so, you know, this whole sort of, and what about the educators? The educators are the sector, right? They are the theory of change and action and then outcome. So I just, I want to say like, as we build back better, we've got to try to reframe and interrupt that narrative that tends to go to children and families immediately. I am not suggesting they're not important, but they are not actually the key ingredients in the system. They are the, those who take it up. And I think if we could reframe to think about building up the human capital part of the sector, it would be easier than trying to make the case that educator well-being is just a, a nice to do, not a need to do. 
And related to that, I'll say one other thing. Part of the genesis for this study, and I, I really um, am, am excited to make good on this in the next couple of years, was to identify what we call and have coined kind of micro features of quality. Not big, broad indicators. Again, I'm thinking about how do we build the human capital part of the infrastructure? We make them into very supported, well-resourced and reflective practitioners. So what we have been, you know, a major genesis for this study was to identify across the mixed delivery system. The through line in the whole system is the quality of the interactions between the adults and the children they serve and the way in which the adults can set up the quality of the interactions and the, and the environment, the care and learning environment. So the other piece in all of this is, is to drive policy strategy that is, that is less siloed itself in terms of the settings and is more hyper-focused on what goes on inside of settings irrespective of type. And the two I would say are related. And um, certainly I would uh, echo that um, within Educare, within that reflective practice, we do have master teachers where we have 12 classrooms and we have four, uh, four master teachers. Well, we'll have four master teachers and they are each assigned to classrooms and they're doing that day-to-day, -day, that reflective practice, that coaching, that mentoring. And that is specifically for the teacher, for the workforce to help to build them up, which is so important. But I will also, um, when we talk about well-being, um, I think about the place where our workforce and where our children and where our families are coming from. Well, over these past this past year almost, we have seen an increase of instances of domestic violence. We have seen civil unrest, political unrest, racial unrest. Um, and these are the things that our children are also donning a layer of on them whether they understand every word that is spoken, every image that they see, it is still part of the stress that they have. And in turn, they're bringing that stress into the, the centers, into the family child care, into the, to the um, child care centers. And then that is then bringing an additional stress that our workforce has to deal with while still dealing with the stress themselves. And so when I think about well-being, I think about going forward, that we really need to focus on hope informed care. We cannot, you know, take away the images they've already taken in or the sounds they've already taken in, but we need to focus on hope informed care going forward to better be able to have these conversations with the, the children to equip the workforce to have these conversations. You know, right now we're, we're sending these children in with all these different stresses and all these different traumas that some teachers may or some providers may not know how to deal with and that's additional stress and so I, I going forward we have to put an additional layer of training of strategy of support to our providers center-based or home-based so that they can then not only deal with their own traumas but also deal with the traumas that are showing up at their doors every single day family service coordinators they're also dealing with that as well we need to make sure that people can deal with people or else, you know, we're, we're going to have a very hard time moving any of these needles forward because if someone is so stressed, so traumatized, they cannot take in professional development. They cannot, you know, continue their studies to be the next level teacher. They just cannot do it. So, you know, when we look at well-being, we have to look, really look at that this is the time we have to really look at the individual um, to make sure that they are equipped to be able to work and change and to cycle through the systems that are there. And this, thank you. And this is an audience question, um, and it's for any of you. Um, how might the Harvard findings inform specific policy recommendations for urgent anti-racism and equity agendas? And what suggestions do the panelists have for subsequent research? Want me to? Uh, yeah, anyone can jump in. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm not sure I'm going to say anything totally new, but I'm going to tie a few things together. I think um, 
there are some policy strategies, right, that we that in are clearly uh, warranted in response to some of these findings, which in many ways are confirmed, have been you know uh, thought about for a long time. I think the funding model, um, it sort of, it sort of feels like. It's, it's practically expired at this point. Like it's been outdated, a pandemic hits and, and I feel like I, I cannot imagine going back and not going forward here. And it's sort of like the final, final straw to tell us um, we have set up something that is not actually a system. I think the other piece there, big macro sort of equity and access big picture um, is, also to remind ourselves that we have yet as a nation actually to make real significant state level investments that still the great majority of funds come from a large block grant that won't, to the commissioner's point, that actually won't fund the system. And then we talk about the system as though it's a state level enterprise um, and we regulate it and we have all these, you know, sort of licensing processes and lots of opinion and that and we're actually not we're not there on a on a on a funding you know we haven't committed um so what does that leave us in a race and equity lens it leaves us um with the in this case our estimates uh the providers who are in uh the k-12 system serving four-year-olds are are mostly uh white and women uh it leaves a lot of uh, disparities in in terms of income, those with the the least stable incomes tend to be uh, our individuals of color who are deeply committed to their neighborhoods and their families. Um, and serving, let's remember, this is this is supposed to be about a next generation as well. They too then are serving in relatively segregated communities of color. So right there lies the problem, right? Which is that the segregated environment confounded with a funding structure that puts the work on the back of the single provider, right? Taking cash from those families or taking subsidies that are tremendously administratively burdensome just, just creates a cycle that we're now seeing come to the surface. Not that we didn't know about it, but at scale, we can capture it. Big, big, big picture, early ed was meant to be an, a, an anti-racist equity strategy, right? That in many ways, the principles and the promise have so much to do um, with anti-poverty, anti-racist principles. And yet again, we just, we have not, we have not invested in those individuals and their families in the way to nearly to the levels that those providers have invested in those families and communities. So tremendous disparities all around, no question. But lots of promise to the commissioner's point. I would just start with the funding model because I think unless you interrupt that, create more stability at the neighborhood level, we're not gonna get there. I would just add uh, to that, and I think um, just uh, everything um, that was said, and I think encapsulating also just the the bigger uh, societal question um, that that's pointed out of um, whether you know, families that rely on childcare are ones that don't have a lot of other options either, right? I mean, it's the extended day for K-12. Our childcare system goes up to age 15. So that's working families who need after school care, before school care, um, vacation care, and often complementing the system that's serving the youngest kids. Uh, and, and we need to think about it from a family's perspective not discounting what Noni was saying around that those families rely on the workforce, um, but we have the we have exposed in this that the families that need it the most and the workforce that need it the most are those that are uh, that are most vulnerable.
and um, the larger equity issue that this calls into play. We know that families with younger children have lower incomes. We know that we don't start subsidizing child care in any sort of care for children until they turn five. So how do we start to think about the equity um, and how the policies that we're going to take with us, not only from the individual system at early education and care and what we can do on financing and all of these things, but how we also make the larger case that sustaining the system as infrastructure is an is an investment in a more equitable society because those that need it will be able to access it. Um, and those that work in it will not be as vulnerable um, as the families they are, that they're trying to support. And I, and I think also from that same lens, when we're looking at which families are utilizing which form of childcare, and we have to think about, um, you know, in many ways, as Commissioner just said, there's a lot of separate and still not equal in how in the different centers where they are based and who goes there. And so when we, we think about it we, and we think about families making the choices of where to send their children, it's going to be transportation. Can I get the child there? You know, is it going to be for my work hours that I need? But I think more importantly is, can I send my child somewhere that I know they are going to be culturally safe, culturally relevant, culturally informed, culturally acceptable, agile? Do you really, do parents, do our families send their children places where they think that probably their worst nightmare might happen, that your child would be treated differently or um, harmed? because of the color of their skin, their ethnicity, their race, their religion, or what have you. So, you know, maybe having also that knowledge, that information of why aren't people sending their children to certain care settings is going to be very um, important when we're having these anti-racist, anti-bias conversations, because why are, why is there still separation? Why does it still exist? And or why are people still choosing? To, to stay separate. I think that those are two really, really important things that we can't forget because we can have as many slots as possible, but it's the families that choose where to send their children. I don't think that we can not have that lens on that on the families in their family choice. Absolutely. I wanna thank you all again uh, for a wonderful panel discussion. And I, I just thought this discussion was so rich and so insightful. I uh, really appreciate um, being able to moderate with you, moderate this panel. Um, and now I will pass it back to Dan for closing statement. Shana, thank you. And thank you to all of the panel. What a terrific conversation this afternoon. We're so glad uh, to have all of you as, as panelists join us and all of you uh, who are viewing as well. So I want to extend certainly our thanks to Shana Cook, uh, Senior Manager of the Early Learning Systems of the Bainham Family Foundation in Washington, D.C., Dr. Noni Lasso, Co-Director of the Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, Commissioner Samantha agner Traworgi of uh, Massachusetts, and Nikki Burnett, Director of Educare Springfield. As we wrap up, I do want to call your attention to uh, a couple of notes that we left for you in the chat related to our uh, upcoming uh, programs. And so I wanted to take just a moment to highlight that. Our popular uh, Early Childhood Philanthropy Series will be back uh, on the 23rd of this month at 2 p.m. We'll be speaking with Ellen Roche, uh, Executive Director of Trust for Learning, Mika Sales of the Duke Endowment, and uh, Monica Hobbs Vinland of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Also want to mention to you, if you have the opportunity, this coming Thursday, uh, our Race and Education series will be back uh, looking at the intersections between racism and gender in education policy, which should be a really fascinating uh, conversation. There are links to both uh, of these opportunities in the chat. Uh, or if you want to go back and find them after the fact, you can certainly uh, seek out uh, both of those links on the Hunt Institute social media uh, channels uh, at Hunt uh, underscore Institute uh, or at my uh, Twitter at Dan Worry. Uh, we are really grateful for all of you being with us again today. I want to thank the panel once more and wish you all a terrific afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks.